So in my continuing lessons on the letter to the Romans, I'm going to be hitting the sec second part of chapter 5 as well as kind of the beginning of, of chapter 6 this morning. Um, and from 6.11 there, it says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This word consider means to, is the same one that's in Philippians 4.8 where it says, Think on these things. Uh, whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, and all those things. We need to, how do we think? How do we force ourselves to think about stuff? Well, I know I call that kind of our inner voice. You have that little voice, you kind of talk to yourself, you ever have that little conversation with yourself? And that inner, what is that inner voice saying to us? What are we saying to ourselves? Our, you know, sometimes that inner voice is critical of us. Oh, you blew it. Sometimes that inner voice, you know, is doubting or, or fearful. But what God does, and actually a lot of places in Scripture, He's encouraging us, how do we talk to ourselves? How do we think? What are the things we're focused on in the way we're thinking within ourselves? Because that's really critical. It's kind of, a, kind of an application, at least for me. I was thinking about this a lot this week. Um, isn't every place kind of you look on TV, news, worldwide, isn't strife and tension almost everywhere? I mean, it really is one of the reasons that I think so many people have turned away from sport, especially football, with controversy is because certain kinds of entertainment and it's not just sports, by the way. It might be Broadway plays. And, and there are people, you know, they don't want the, the Broadway actors, you know, giving them a political lecture. We just get tired of having everything raise tension, right? It's just stressful. It's difficult to have no place where we can just have peace and that we can just enjoy ourselves for a moment. And so I think, and it isn't just in our country. When we look at, we can go all the way back to, to President Bush, the second one, when he wanted to kind of go through the, and try to free the peoples of the Arab world, right? North Africa, the Middle East. They were like, okay, well, they're going to have this chance for democracy, get rid of all these dictators, and there will be peace in our time, I think was kind of the wish. <laughs> um, and what has happened is just a unimaginable strife, and sometimes, yes, they've gotten rid of dictators, and what's coming behind has sometimes been worse. And it's hard to imagine that, right? you got these brutal, horrible dictators, and what comes and follows them is like, oh, this isn't better. <laughs> and there, we have strife, and there's political upheaval all over the world. I don't know if there's just something in the water worldwide, but there just seems to be upheaval. And the issue is... How does all of that affect us as Christians? Because we talked about last week, because we're Christians, we ought to have peace, and faith, and grace, and hope. We've got all these great things, but sometimes the world just kind of sucks all of that stuff out of us, or is trying to. So how do we keep this graciousness of God's? How do we keep it in our heart and mind? And I think some of what we're talking about today talks about that. We have got to consider ourselves a certain way. The world around us may be tearing us up. It might be, it might be causing turmoil, stress, all kinds of things. But what are we saying in ourselves and what are we saying with God? Because that is our refuge. God is our boast. He is our hope. He is our peace. And that's where we have to find that comfort and that graciousness that fills us up. So regardless of all the strife going around, we're joyful, right? Because we've been commanded to be joyful all the time. Not always easy. Especially, you know, difficult circumstances, and there, there's worldwide circumstances beyond our control. There's 
you know, there, there's pain and suffering and death amongst those whom we love that we can't control. God understands all that. But he says, you can get through this. I will be with you all the way. We will make our home with you as Jesus promised. We will walk with you. We will be with you all the time. But we have to, since we can't see them with our eyes. In fact, you ever notice sometimes that you kind of forget something and then you see something or maybe you hear something and it, boom, it pops back into your brain. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I show up maybe at church and I, I said I would bring something for somebody. Now, fortunately, it didn't happen this morning that I'm aware of. <laughs> that I would bring something for somebody and I don't forget to do it. And then I see them and go, oh, I left that at home. <laughs> because for us, seeing is a, is a reminder. Hearing music. How many times, especially as you're older, you hear music from bygone generations. You go, oh, I can't remember where I was that summer. <laughs> or that was a very popular song. Memories get stuck in us through our senses. But God doesn't come into us through our senses except for our reading and our hearing people talk about it. And so we have to go out of our way to remind ourselves of what God has told us because we're not going to come around a corner and see Him. We're not going to come around a corner and hear Him. We have to have a conversation going on in our head that reminds us who we are in God. Now, I thought I'd forgotten something else. <clears throat> Paul, explaining the fullness of the gospel in the book of Romans, talked about being promised long ago that it's God's power to save sinners, that it's a matter of changing the heart, that it is God's power to justify us by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus' blood. Because we trust Him. And he says, consider Abraham. Abraham was saved the same way. And he says, since we've been just by faith, we boast in God, in the grace and hope and peace that we have in Him. And then he comes here, and what we're going to look at here in the latter part of chapter 5, is he says, Adam is an image of Jesus. Now, you can, on the, on the, if you're thinking about it, you might be able to, without, without reading what the passage is talking about, you might go, well, yeah, you know, Adam is the one that every single human being is related to in the flesh. Not just related to, we are a subset, we are just a portion of what he was. There isn't, any, isn't anything been added to that DNA that God created initially. There's one set of DNA he created. And every other one is just some kind of take it apart, put it back together in some other form. It all came from Adam, which, by the way, is the word for man, which is why all human beings are man or mankind. We are all from Adam. And so Jesus, okay, well, Adam gave life to all of our physical bodies, but he doesn't give life to us spiritually. Even Abraham doesn't give life to us spiritually. Even though he's the father of the faithful, he still needed to be justified. He still needed to be forgiven. But Jesus is the one who gives life to all spiritually. And so, in that sense, he's, he's kind of like Adam. That, that would be my way of thinking. Now, that's not exactly what this passage focuses on. But you can see kind of similarities between Jesus and Adam. And he talks about that, and we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail. He says, and then in the first six or 11 verses of chapter 6, it starts with a question. Okay, what then do we say about ourselves? Oh, one, one focusing on me. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I know... Sometimes I can ignore all the stuff that's going on, people moving around, walking around. <laughs> but he's kind of like... <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay, <laughs> within me, 
that he was trying to, to give a message to. So, <laughs> uh, but it like got me out of my train of thought. So chapter six comes, and in the first five chapters of, of the book of Romans, he is explaining to us why we can be saved by God's gospel. And that is we are justified by faith in the redemption of Christ's blood. That's what the whole first five chapters are essentially about. Now, there's lots of parts to that whole thing. It's a, it's a very complex teaching of God's. But he comes in and says, what, what do we say then? What is our, what do we do with this? And that's where we look at chapter 6, and it's going to end at that verse we, I started with, we need to consider ourselves. We're dead to sin. You're dead to me. Sin, you're dead to me. I live for God. I live because of God. I live for God. That's what he's telling us to think about in ourselves. So, because we've been justified, we have been made whole and righteous. So we need to focus not on sin, but on living for God. Now, here in uh, Romans 5, 12 through 21. Let me go ahead and, I'm going to go ahead and read the whole section, and then I'm just going to point out the comparisons that he's making here. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Now, let's just stop there for a moment. He talks about, so sin enters through Adam, but this one man. And then death is the result of sin. In fact, God says, that day you sin, you will surely die. You, know, you break the commandment. And we sometimes, well, he didn't die in the flesh, but he did die spiritually. He was cast away from God. And so, in the death that's being talked about in the book of Romans is more often than not spiritual death in life. And so he's talking about that death results from the sin, and death spread to everybody because all sin. Now, if you're talking about death in the flesh, death in the flesh spread to everybody not because of the sin, well, you could say it's a result of sort of the sin, but it's because God kicked them out of the tree of the garden. So they didn't have the tree of life to eat from anymore. And so when kicking them out, they were going to die. Flesh was going to die. And so he says that because everybody sinned, we all died spiritually. Adam's the one that brought that to all of us. Spreads, he brought sin to everybody's doorstep. We all took a bite. And therefore we all died. Romans chapter 3, talk about we've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. He says, For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Now, I want you to stop for a second that kind of phrase, sin, sin is not counted where there is no law. That's actually a, sometimes a difficult, something's a sin, something's not right, but there's no law against it. What does that mean? In fact, haven't you as parents, don't sometimes the rules in your household develop over time because of something people, the kids do? So I, it's like, I would never expect you to do that. Now that you've done that, that's a new rule. No doing that anymore. <laughs> so sometimes things are wrong, but there hasn't been any stated rule about it. We have that in countries, right? There's a lot of wrong that people do, do to each other. Is there a law against it? Like say, in our country, we have the right, according to the Constitution, to say anything to anybody, pretty much, with very small exceptions. Doesn't make it right, does it? Doesn't make it good, doesn't make it helpful, doesn't make it godly. Lots of it's sin. And yet it's not against the law, in a sense. And that's what God is kind of telling us. There weren't a lot of commandments from God. And yet people still sinned. They were still practicing that which was wrong. 
Now, he says in verse 14, Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So he said, this word type is actually the word of a pattern. You know a dress pattern? It's the word tupos in uh, Greek. It, it actually means a tracing pattern. Okay? It's, it's the idea of an image of something. And he says, Adam is an image. It's like foreshadowing about Jesus. Well, what's the image? Now, it's going to be in some ways kind of a, a contrasting image, but it's an image nonetheless. And he says, but the free gift is not like the trespass. So he stops for a second and says, just understand, for, I'm not saying that what Jesus gives us, the free gift, it's not like the thing that Adam did. Adam gives us the sin, Jesus gives us the free gift. Those two things aren't alike. He's saying there's an image here of Adam and Jesus. Now, he says, If many died through one man's trespass, much more have, have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So he says, listen, if through one man you ended up with death because of sin. And he's already explained that process to us. He says, how much more is the life, is the grace that's going to come through the gift that Jesus has given? Now, again, that's a process. It's already been explained for us in the book of Romans, right? How do we get that grace? By trusting him, right? We get that grace because He paid the price to redeem us, buy us back from our sins, justify us before God. He did all of that, and if we, He's done all that work, if we will trust Him, He will pay the price. So that, that process has already been explained. He's describing here kind of the results of the process. Starts with Adam, ends with death. Starts with Jesus... It ends with grace and life. And so he says, For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. So sin led to condemnation. The free gift leads to justification. And he says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also must reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, just a, a moment, kind of a side thing there. He talks about, you got this idea of trespass and sin, and they're sort of synonyms, but in some ways they're not. Sin means I missed the mark. I, if I, I was trying to do this, I didn't do it. That's what sin is. Trespass means, and we see the word, there's no trespassing, right? What does no trespassing mean when you see that sign? That there is a line you're not supposed to cross. On one side of the line, you're not trespassing. On the other side of the line, you're trespassing. You have gone beyond into somebody's property, private property. And what he's saying is the reason the law of Moses came was to increase the trespasses. God says, listen, I'm going to show you how sinful you are. I'm going to give you lots and lots of commandments and show you you can't keep them. And you sin in a lot of ways. That's what the law does. And he says, I'm going to show you that. Chapter 7 kind of talks about that concept. Why God was trying to help us see that we're sinners. That we don't practice righteousness. We don't do the right thing most of the time. 
So let me just kind of sum that up. Sin comes through Adam. The gift or free gift comes through Jesus. Sin brings condemnation. The gift brings justification. Sin reigns in death. See, sin is supreme. You sin, you get death. He says, but the gift reigns in life. All died because all sinned, right? Death happened because everybody sinned. Well, what about over here? Does everybody get life because everybody receives the gift? So why do we live? Does everybody live? Jesus has already told us not everybody goes down the narrow way, narrow path that leads to life, right? The majority are going to go down the wide path that leads to death. And so, well, who, how do we get this life? And that's kind of what chapter 6 What should we do then? So even though it starts with, what shall we say then? It says, are we to continue? It talks about the practices we do. Should we sin so grace grows even more? The phrase that Paul uses is basically saying that should never even be thought about. <laughs> Let that concept never exist is what essentially his words are. And so that, that's crazy talk. That's crazy thinking. Get rid of that. Beca and why? Because sin is what got us into this mess in the first place. Don't continue down that mess. He says, don't you know this? And so he goes on. They're going to read this, read this passage and see this concept. Don't you know that you are crucified? You crucified that old man of sin. You, bur you were buried with him and that you were raised up with him in new life. And I think you can see pretty easily the concepts of repentance, baptism, and a new life in Christ. A resurrection. Eternal life, in a sense. But he goes on. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So what he tells us is that God has given to us a pattern by which we follow Christ. He was crucified, he was buried, and he rose. And he says, we do the same thing in a spiritual sense. We crucify that old person who sought sin. And we are buried with him in baptism that we might raise up into new life with God. He says, that's what, and he's saying, listen, don't you know this? We've all done this. We have all gone through these things. We did it for this reason, to kill sin. And to live for God. Now, he says, For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. Or like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. But for one who has died has been set free from sin. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, we weren't crucified in the way Romans did it, but he's saying we needed to crucify sin. 
that person who sinned and who liked sin and who desired sin and who walked in sin, that person needs to be crucified. That's not a one-time thing, by the way, for people. The book of Ephesians talks about how, you know, it's kind of a, a daily thing to put off the old man of sin, put on Christ. It is a continual process that we do. But he says, when we have decided to crucify that old man, so I don't want to walk that way anymore. I want to live. I don't want to die. I want to live. Then he says, come to me. You walk with me and you will live. And so we crucify that old man. We're buried with him in the waters of baptism. And we are raised with him in new life in Christ. I, I, I always liked this image, you know, of just a father walking, holding his hand of his little child who, who can't really walk on his own yet because that's us isn't it especially when we're first become christians we're really not you know kind of all grown up and mature we might be in a physical sense but we're not in a spiritual sense we're little babes and we need him all the time because we're going to trip and stumble and fall and hit our heads sometimes we're going to you know scrape our knees we're going to and we got to keep just keep going. Sometimes we need his hand to keep get up and keep going. But he's reminding us this is what we've done. All of us, he says, who are into in Christ Jesus have done this. And so he says, Jesus died for sin but lives for God. And he says, you need to do that too. Now, as we conclude, I want us to think about this concept about the inner voice, because there's actually a, a number of places in the scripture, scriptures where it talks about this idea. In fact, if you ever go and look it up, if you have a way, you just kind of go, you know, in your Bible, uh, you know, if you have a software or something, you can go look up the Greek word used here, um, both in Romans and another passage I'm going to show you in Philippians 4, 8 and kind of follow it all through the New Testament. And it talks about the way we ought to think about what's really real. It's not to think about things that are fantasies or wishes. It's supposed to think about, you need to consider in your mind, think about the things that are really real that, in terms of what's good and righteous and holy and that you are alive in him. Now, there's passages where it talks about to the poor. He says, if you're poor in this world, you ought to think of yourselves as rich. If you're rich in this world, you ought to think of yourselves as, I'm a poor, humble servant before God. Because the tendency for both of those sometimes is to we're rich, we think we're, we think we're more than we really are, just like Laodiceans did in Revelation chapter 3. Or you're poor and you think, I'm nothing. God said, that's just not true. You're rich. You've got great power. I'm with you all the time. Remember that. Think on that. Consider that. That self-voice. Now, God doesn't use it that doesn't say it in that way, but I think that's a fairly common idea for us, that idea of we have an inner voice that kind of talks to ourselves, that self-talk, that, that, that thing we, we have, that conversation in our head. And very often that conversation in our head has been driven by our experiences being raised in our families, good or bad. And experiences not only in the family, but sometimes in school and other places and, and just with other people, you know, bullies and whatever. In fact, kind of a, since I've got a few moments here, something I've been thinking a lot about, you know, especially seeing on Facebook all, all the women who have said me too about being, you know, sexually harassed and things. And I, I kind of was linking it to something, I think I don't know if Jeremy's the one that posted it, but some guy talking about how many men actually 
go up and talk to women, just kind of, they see some woman they like and just go talk to her. And it's really tiny percentage of men who will do that. In fact, it's the men you generally don't want <laughs> to spend your life with. Are the guy, they're, the, they're the guys that, you know. And so they get this name, all men are like this. But actually, all men aren't like this. In fact, I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot about this, this concept of bullying, not only the sexual assault. I think it's all a, an extension of the bullying we see even as children. We see some children bully other children, right? And, but it's not everybody, is it? In fact, I don't know, Harvey Weinstein, I don't know how many people have been accused of him and, you know, his kind of predator behavior. He, had, he was obviously had planned a lot of it. Um, I don't know, 40, 50 people or women or more. If you were to say, okay, I don't know what number, I don't know what percentage are. Let's say 50% of, of all women have been sexually assaulted slash harassed in some way. What percentage of men are the perpetrators? I'll bet you it's a pretty small number. Now, we tend to think, well, it's just all men. No, I, I bet it's all those predators. It's all those bullies. How many people were bullies? I remember the bullies in school, especially in you know, junior high. Junior high, I started hanging out. You had to walk by a path. There was a group of bullies that picked on people walking by, walking home. You know, I knew most of them, but had been fighting from, with most of them since kindergarten. They were the exact same bullies in kindergarten, by the way, as they were in middle school. And it wasn't, if you look at all the people, it was, it was like four people. And the truth is, you get this, so much of the world, I kind of get sidetracked here, but the idea that this inner voice within us, we need to re remind ourselves who we are. There is going to be difficulties in this life. There's going to be trouble in this life. But we need to remind ourselves who we are and who God has made us. What he's given us by his very life. And so this, I'm no good, I'm a failure. I think a lot of that comes from the bullies of the world. And it isn't just males. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you girls remember bully girls that were bullies. And I actually had one of those too. <laughs> Uh, a girl who was a bully. Now, could I have actually physically have defended myself against her? I probably could have, but I wouldn't have. She knew it, and she picked on me mercilessly for, for a number of years, through all the way to school, through middle school, and she was just a bully. There's a number of them in school. And that's where a lot of sometimes this concept of we think we're no good, we're a failure, we're, there's something wrong with us because somebody else attacked us. And God's saying, I'm more powerful than all of them, and I am with you all the time. And that's what he's trying to get us to understand, that they can't do anything to us. They can't separate me from God. They can't take away my inheritance. They can't take away all the blessings. I've got all of it. He's given that to me. And so that inner voice, we need to remind ourselves, I'm alive. I live for God. I'm not shrinking back. I'm out there. I'm going to get up, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to live for God. I'm not going to hide for God. I'm not going to shrink back for God. I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to voice, and I'm going to live for God. That's, I think, what he's trying to get us to see about ourselves, that we're with him. Just like he tried to get Israel to see that when they were coming into the promised land, right? Right? I'm with you. One of you can, can, dis, can defeat a thousand of them if I'm with you. Remember that I'll always be with you. And so 
In the Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Put them into your brain, he says. Look at the good things you've got. Look at the honorable, just, true, pure, lovely, commendable stuff that's all around you. Now, it doesn't mean there isn't bad. In fact, there's probably still a majority of bad, isn't there? Why would he have to encourage us if this, if most of it was all of this? If almost everything we experienced was this, he wouldn't have to remind us of it, would he? But most of what we experience is not this. That's why he's telling us to hold on to it. Think about it. Make it who you are. We're going to end here. Appreciate it.